A warning, this episode features detailed discussion of sexual assault. We need to talk about Cosby is W. Kamau Bell's new Showtime docuseries about, who else? Bill Cosby. Bell seeks to better understand a man full of contradictions and complexities. He traces Cosby's remarkable career and legacy and how he became one of the biggest stars of the 20th century. He also traces the comedian's downfall. Over 60 women have accused Cosby of sexual assault. The docuseries amounts to a complicated and powerful exercise. I'm Aisha Harris, and on today's episode of NPR's Pop Culture Happy Hour, we're discussing We Need to Talk About Cosby. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Ursa Major Skin Care. Obsessively crafting clean face and body care essentials made with a spirit of adventure. Ursa Major's fantastic face wash, made with cedar, spearmint, and lime, is designed to keep your face feeling fresh and clean while transporting you to the great outdoors. Enter code POP at ursamajorvt.com for 20% off your order. Joining me today is NPR TV critic Eric Deggins. Hey, Eric, and welcome back. Hey. And also here are the co-hosts of the podcast Fanti, journalist Travel Anderson and journalist, writer, and producer Jarrett Hill. Welcome back to you both. It's great to have you here. Hi, thanks for having us. Hey, hey, thank you. So at the beginning of We Need to Talk About Cosby, W. Kamau Bell explains why he feels the urge to have this discussion. He calls himself a child of Bill Cosby. He's a Black man and stand-up comic who was born in the 70s and grew up watching Fat Albert and The Cosby Show. Over the course of four episodes, Bell finds interesting ways to make cases for both Cosby's artistry and influence, as well as the fact that over 60 women have accused Cosby of sexual assault. Now, the talking heads assembled for this reads like a sort of who's who of prominent Black cultural experts and commentators, including Jamel Hill, Tressie McMillan Cotton, Jelani Cobb, and Mark Lamont Hill. He also conducted interviews with fellow comedians, some of Cosby's accusers, and even a handful of Cosby Show alumni. Cosby was convicted of sexual assault in 2018, but that conviction was overturned on a technicality last summer, just as Bell was wrapping up production on the docuseries. Bell actually folds this conundrum into the final chapter of the saga. A spokesperson for Cosby has called the documentary a, quote, PR hack and has denied all allegations of sexual assault. You can watch the series now on Showtime. So I want to just start with you, Jared. What are your thoughts on we need to talk about Cosby and what it's sort of trying to get out here. I actually thought that the central question that they ask at the beginning of the episode and at the end of the last episode was a really fantastic way to frame this conversation. They ask, who is Bill Cosby? And I thought that was such a challenging question to answer nowadays about someone who we all know, right? That we're all very familiar with and have our own respective histories with. And, you know, some of their answers were, ugh. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You know what I mean? (laughs) Like, it's a a hard thing. (laughs) It was such a great way to open and close the documentary. And I felt like the entire documentary spends a lot of time contextualizing who Bill Cosby is and what Bill Cosby did. And I think it was uh, really smartly laid out in that way. Yeah, I think it's really part of what makes this work so well, because I think so often when we're talking about these conversations, we're asking, can you separate the art from the artist? Or should we still be watching or listening to or or engaging with whatever that is? And I think just starting with, okay, who is this person is such a different question and the kind we're not often asking. And I don't know if that's even really what the documentary is trying to, at the end of the day, really prove, because it seems kind of hard to do. I definitely think posing that question makes it so much more interesting and challenging than an exercise like this could usually be. Absolutely. Travel, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, I think one of the things I appreciated about the docu-series is how, like, rooted in Blackness it is. I feel like when we were initially having conversations about Bill Cosby, about R. Kelly, about Michael Jackson over the last few years, there always seemed to be a different conversation happening in white spaces versus Black spaces. Mm -hmm. And I think the docuseries does a good job of particularly contextualizing what it is like for us as Black folks to have this conversation about Bill Cosby in terms of what he represented, what he gave back to Black people and Black communities, and how there's a unique kind of 
consternation that we have when we're answering that question of who Bill Cosby is because of that unique and particular context. So I think Kamau and his team, they did a great job of like, you know, building that specificity around this conversation. It's clear, right, that Kamau and the bulk of the people in the docuseries believe Cosby sexually assaulted these people. They believe that Cosby was being a great kind of representative of the race while also inflicting a lot of, you know, what they believe is, you know, harm on a lot of folks. And so the documentary is unapologetically from that that standpoint. And I think it allows them to hit on some things that if they did not believe that, it might turn into a different docuseries. Right. Now, Eric, you actually had a chance to interview W. Kamau Bell for Sundance, because the docuseries actually premiered at Sundance. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like for you to interview him and what you sort of ultimately took away from this doc? Yeah, I met him when he was doing this late night show for FX called Totally Biased. So it was kind of cool to reconnect with him and see him doing something that I think is sort of a culmination of everything he's been doing as an artist up to this point. The stand-up that he's done where he talks a lot about race and talks a lot about gender. The show that he's done for CNN, he goes out and tries to have uncomfortable conversations and move things forward and talking about structural racism and talking about issues affecting people of color. And now he's found a documentary where he was able to pull all of that together One of the things that he said to me that I thought was really interesting was that when he heard the story about Bill Cosby and Black stuntmen, because Bill Cosby insisted that they use Black men to be his stunt doubles on I Spy, the show that he did in the mid-1960s, that created a whole industry because before that, they were dressing up white men in Blackface, literal Blackface, like not brownface, but like Blackface. And having them double for people like Sidney Poitier, or there's a story in the doc where a black woman who was in the Bond film, Live and Let Die. Gloria Hendry. A white guy doubled her, right? (laughs) Who was was Mm -hmm. painted black. Because of what Cosby did, he's at these pivotal moments in black history. And if we don't talk about Cosby at all, then we erase that black history. And so he's trying to spur this conversation so we don't lose these important, crucial elements of black history just because you know, Bill Cosby was a part of them. I thought that was interesting. And he also said he didn't try to talk to Cosby. The women who say that he sexually assaulted them were trusting Kamal a lot with their stories. And he didn't want to have to go back to them and say, oh, by the way, you know, Bill Cosby has agreed to talk, so we're going to air everything he has to say about you as well. And since he personally um, says in the doc that he believes the women who have accused Bill Cosby of sexual assault He just decided he wanted to have a conversation about Cosby and not with Cosby. But I do think that's one reason why the doc does not really answer that question, who is Bill Cosby? Because I think Mm -hmm. ultimately, if what all these women have accused him of is true, then the answer may be that he created this incredibly detailed and useful public face that fooled everybody. And not only fooled everybody, but led to historic gains for Black people in some areas. Mm -hmm. And on the other side of that, he was committing these horrific crimes, according to what the women who've accused him have said. So just asking the question, who is Bill Cosby, and having the people interviewed in the doc try to explain it, that gets at all the things that Travell was talking about. Yeah. I mean, what I found really interesting the way in which he really puts all of these things very much side by side. And so even when he goes off down this road of like talking about the black stunt people, and then like also at one point, he interviews a couple of former Playboy bunnies, but then it turns into like this whole backstory that I don't think we necessarily needed about the Playboy history and lore where I was like, it felt kind of long. But even when he goes down those rabbit holes, he's still stopping and taking a beat to have this visual timeline Mm -hmm. of the accusers and the victims. So like if it's, you know, 1969 or whatever, he'll have like whatever he was doing in 1969 alongside this image of women either talking about something that happened then or um, you overhear their voices. And it's like really powerful to see those two things happening. And so seeing that all side by side in a way, I think, 
makes this a different experience than all the many. And there have been many really good think pieces and essays about sort of the downfall of Cosby since all of this came to a head. But I think it really sort of shines in this visual medium in a way that if you're watching it, you can't help but be compelled and and feel as though, yeah, it is more complicated than you might want it to be. Like, I think it's possible to believe that he believed the things that he was saying when it either when it came to education, when it came to being proud of being black, like it's very possible that he believed all those things. And maybe it wasn't necessarily like a quote unquote front, but this was just another side of him. And so I thought that was really, really powerful. You know, we're kind of in this age now of having sexual assault survivors and and people who have accused others of assaulting them where we are hearing them tell their stories. And the R. Kelly doc sort of spearheaded that. And that was like kind of a different exercise because that was mostly focused on the survivors, but this kind of balances a few other things. But I found it really powerful that one of the survivors sort of was like, I'm not going to go into the details of recounting these moments. I will tell you about my other experiences, but like I'm not going to go into details of like what I say happened to me. And so I'm curious what you think about whether or not you felt as though those voices were needed or if you felt like maybe it was too much? Like, how do you feel about this moment where we are asking survivors to sort of relive these things over and over? When I saw the women sitting there, like on the couch, getting ready to speak, I was like, I want to hear their stories. But I also appreciate the way that like, we tread the line of re-victimizing them by having them go through all of the trauma that they experienced, right? I will say that I thought it was really powerful because I didn't realize how many of the accusers were, you know, outwardly saying like, I don't remember what happened after X. I remember being drugged. I remember feeling a certain kind of way. And then I remember waking up naked and he was there, right? I think also with the recounting of their stories, it was helpful for me to be able to kind of see like the patterns, right? Of grooming. And I always say I was raised on Jesus and Oprah. And like Oprah has talked about sexual assault quite a bit. (laughs) And and, like (laughs) Oprah always talked about the way that like sexual predators will groom their victims or their prey, if you will. And I thought that was really, really um, well laid out in the episodes because it was like, oh, Bill Cosby was a serial rapist, allegedly, right? Like, according to all of these accounts. This was something that he was doing over the course of decades and was doing in a way that showed that there was skill and strategy and planning and a team of people, you know, that were complicit. It just kind of laid it out for me in a different kind of way than seeing a a magazine cover with a bunch of faces of people who are making claims. And so I thought that there was a lot of value in hearing these women tell their stories, but also recognize that it's got to be really difficult to do that to be a part of this documentary. Well, one of the things that also stuck out to me were the instances where we saw they would have different talking head folks, including these women, watch different clips from the TV show. And some of the women are like, I can't watch that, right? Mm -hmm. And to see that they had some sort of, of agency about like how they showed up in this doc also I think was a positive and it was refreshing and it kind of showed that they at least had a little bit of agency even if they were willing to participate in this exercise that might be a little bit triggering or re-traumatizing for them and I think also many of them particularly the black ones were vocal about like they participated because the John Q public thought that this was white women accusing Bill Cosby. Mm -hmm. And they're like, I'm here too. Right. And I think that that's another thing that like stuck out to me about the inclusion of these particular voices in the docuseries. I think that's an important element of this is people wanting to tell their stories and be seen and have the world say, or Kamal Bell say, I believe you. I do think we've entered sort of a weird a moment with these stories where the details of them in some way help prove their validity to the audience. If if someone can say, you know, I met him at X club and we had dinner and then we went mm-hmm. there and we did this and we did that, we have sort of become acculturated to kind of expect those kinds of stories given the way some of the bigger stories have played out, everything from the exposure of Harvey Weinstein to surviving R. Kelly. And I wonder if at some point in the distant future, we'll get to the point where we won't ask uh, survivors to be so detailed in what they talk about because we won't 
have to have that level of a specificity to believe them. But we're riding this fine line between recognizing people's pain and having them feel seen versus having them feel exploited. And I think that's something that Kamal was really worried about and worked really hard to avoid in his doc. He was sensitive to how the women who say they are survivors would feel how they were being portrayed, and he wanted to do right by them. We always hear the conversations about, well, why now? Or why didn't someone say something? Or why didn't you tell somebody? And I thought what was so brilliant about each of them telling their stories was they all talked about how they felt afterward. And so often how Bill would guide them into their guilt, if you will, right? By talking about, oh, you had too much to drink, or oh, you blacked out, or oh, you behaved X, Y, Z way. And in one of those stories, she said, like, he talked about how I drank too much. And I had immediately come into this conversation ready to berate him and be like, how dare you do what you did? And then when he said that to me, it made me feel tiny, right? And I was like, oh, But then we also had another actor who was on the show who she said um, that she'd been like pulled off of set into his dressing room and how, you know, the second time she said, I don't want to leave and how everybody just kind of seemed like it was okay. Another account of how there would always be a line of models, you know, waiting to go into his dressing room. And so then I could see how you are in that scenario and you feel like you've done something wrong. And there's this massive machine that's happening around to be able to shield him, if you will. I thought them recounting their stories was really, really helpful in understanding how something like this happens and then how it stays quiet for so long as well. I mean, one of the strongest parts was the way in which his building himself up to be sort of the arbiter of blackness, of like black excellence, Mm -hmm. and how that kind of shielded him in the mind of not just the people who were working with him, but a lot of Black people. There's even this moment, which I totally was not aware of before watching this documentary or had forgotten about it. Bill Cosby's educational history is very sketchy and like he may or may not have graduated from high school and he wound up getting a doctorate, but it was an EDD. (laughs) It's really funny because at one point, Todd Boyd, who's a professor, is just like, throwing some shade at him because (laughs) in a way he's saying it's not a legit doctorate. The EDD is the lowest uh, doctorate uh, that you can get. So a lot of people with EDD will be mad at me for saying that, but you know, you know what it is. Um, But for a PhD, like it's like, you know, uh, playing in the G league and playing in the NBA. (laughs) Even Mark Lamont Hill has like a fascinating story where he criticized Cosby after the pound cake speech where he Mm -hmm. talked about pulling up your pants and, you know, all these other things, like basically admonishing black people for not being good enough or, you know, degrading themselves. And Mark Lamont Hill tells a story about how Cosby basically threatened his job at Temple University and apparently told him, like, why are you screwing around with me? Like, I'm not screwing around with you. Why are you screwing Mm -hmm. around with me? That was what Cosby apparently said to him. Yeah, except he said it in a street way. (laughs) Yes. Right. He said it in a way that I cannot say on NPR. He didn't say it in a this very NPR, NPR kind of way. No. <laughs> but um, just seeing that level of power, I think this just does a really good job of really showing like how just he infiltrated all of, not everyone, but a lot of Black people's psyches and was able to, that's partially why he was able to get away with it for so long. It's interesting. So I teach this class on race and media. And as part of it, I've been teaching the students about different kinds of bias and different ways we kind of fool ourselves. And there's this thing called moral licensing. That's a a psychological dynamic that is you tell yourself because you're a good person and because you feel like you've done good things, that it means that when you do other things that might be questionable, it kind of makes it a little more okay. Right. And I feel like Bill Cosby is sort of like the ultimate expression of that, where he did so many sort of laudable and landmark and important things that at some point that becomes the justification to do whatever. And of course, women have accused him of horrific things. And you get the sense that he is acting as if all this great stuff that he did sort of justifies these other sort of shadier, sketchier things that he's done. We've seen that play out time and time again in the docuseries and then also in real life where he felt emboldened to 
have the critiques that he mm-hmm. had of Black America because he was giving mm-hmm. all this money to Spelman College. And we should also note the ways that other Black people emboldened him as well, mm-hmm. right? Because he was Dr. Bill Cosby, Mr. Huxtable, who had done all of these great things for people. I think one of the things that stuck out to me from the docu series is that as much as it is a conversation about Cosby, it's also a conversation about the socio-political, socio-cultural environment that also allowed Cosby to do it as well. And so it asks us as viewers, as folks who consider themselves to be folks who benefited in, in a lot of ways from what Cosby has done in this industry, to ask ourselves some questions, to interrogate ourselves about like, How were we complicit in this behavior, right? In terms of building up this man to a point where he was infallible for so long until he wasn't. There are so many elements of the Cosby show. So Travell and I did this whole episode on like the complicated feelings we have about Bill Cosby, right? I'm still okay watching the Cosby show in a way that I'm not still comfortable listening to R. Kelly's music because like there's a whole cast of actors that I'm also excited to see and stories and things that I attach to and <laughs> that damn anniversary <laughs> performance. Like it's, you're never going to get over that, right? <laughs> but there are also some moments that feel so overt that you can't ignore them. Mm-hmm. That barbecue sauce moment conversation. Mm. It drove me insane. Like, oh, he was doing this on TV. You know what I mean? Yeah. The Spanish fly and being a gynecologist with an office in the basement. Like, he knew what he was doing. Yeah. Kamau has a lot of people he interviews watch those scenes, like the barbecue sauce scene from Mm -hmm. the Cosby show. And in case you're not, don't remember it, it's a scene where he's made his barbecue sauce and then like they're making a whole joke about how it makes everyone fall in love with each other. Mm -hmm. And it's like an aphrodisiac, basically. My barbecue sauce. Haven't you ever noticed after people have some of my barbecue sauce, after a while when it kicks in, they get all huggy buggy? (laughs) (laughs) This is suddenly creepy. I get what Kamau is trying to do, but then I feel some type of way when I'm seeing these people rewatch it and say like, oh, like, I can't believe we didn't see this. It's like, how could we have seen it? Like, there was no way for us to know. (laughs) It might have been an open secret in Hollywood, but I don't think it was a necessarily open secret within, you know, the wider community. I wish I could push back a little bit on that sort of idea that like he was laying breadcrumbs in a way that like we should have seen it all along like you know you might have heard that he cheated on his wife uh but no one necessarily made the jump that like oh he might have actually been you know sexually assaulting people well i think the spanish fly thing though is different because if you watch that interview where he was on larry king talking about spanish fly i mean you know he's pretty much talking about drugging women and we should have known that in that moment. And Drop you put it in, it in a the Coca-Cola. Drink. Cola. Don't Cut. matter. It doesn't make it. And the girl would drink it. And she's sure. Hello, America. <laughs> and he's on Larry. I think there's a difference between we should have known back then that that joke was gross, and we should have known back right, then that like right. it might be correlating because right. that's like a different thing. Hindsight is twenty twenty for a reason, right? right? Like right. we can look back at these things. I think about how the things were so subtle that you might have had to have been one of his victims or had to have known one of the the stories that had been told to be able to see these things through the lens of this barbecue sauce thing is not okay or him taking women into the basement to be in his office, you know, feels a little murky, right? So I, I fully agree with you there. Jared, is there anything else you want to get to? I want to just say that what's really interesting about this conversation for me is I wouldn't even really have a whole lot of interest in this conversation if Bill Cosby wasn't black. (laughs) I think that Bill Cosby's blackness and his the way that he like affected blackness, right, is what really made this so uniquely difficult. And like when I hear white people discuss it, I'm always like a little bit cringy, right? Because it's like, all right, now tiptoe, (laughs) tiptoe, because and Travell said, well, on our show, like. You know, you can have a conversation about race without tiptoeing into racism, right? Or a, about a black person without being racist. I remember watching this and thinking, like, how much him being black had to do with the way that I felt about it and the way that I was responding to it and who I wanted to hear analysis from. That was something that was inescapable for me. We heard a lot of this stuff in 2005. 
Okay. When Andrea Constan first threatened to file a lawsuit against him and got 13 other women to line up and say that they had also been drugged and raped by Bill Cosby. And it kind of vanished from our collective consciousness. Like people don't even remember that, even though there was a lot of journalism about it. When the stories came up again later, people had kind of fallen out of love with him. Younger generations, especially, the Cosby Mm -hmm. show was a distant memory, and they remembered what a cranky old guy he was with the pound cake speech and all that, and felt Mm -hmm. like he was dissing hip hop culture. And so there was a lot less love for Bill Cosby, um, I think, uh, even amongst black folks when this really emerged, Mm -hmm. as opposed to when we first heard about it. And that made all the difference between him being able to weather the charges and his fall. I think uh, Tressie McMillan Cotton has a great quote where she's like, the pound cake speech, she's like, by then Bill Cosby's audience is no longer us. Like that is an audience for white people. And I think that's a good point. That's like where it sort of started to disintegrate for him in the public imagination. Yeah. And I think that the generational point, because even on our show, Jared, when we talked about Bill Cosby, like your connection to the Cosby show was a lot different than mine. And we're not even that far apart in age. Travel likes to act like we're in different generations. Okay. <laughs> I'm 36 and Travel is 30. And Travel would have you believe I was 512 and Travel was eight. Oh, you're all children. <laughs> Don't even try it. But that's my point, Eric, though. That's my point. <laughs> <laughs> that we're all children. <laughs> we're all Cosby's children. It was a lot easier for me to want to throw Bill Cosby away, you know, when yeah. these yeah. allegations resurfaced a few years ago than it is for someone who, like Kamal Bell, considers themselves to be a child of Bill Cosby. And I think that generational difference with younger folks, you know, wanting to start from a place of believing people who said that they have been victimized contributed to a shift in culture to where we were able to be like, okay, hold on now. Mm -hmm. 60 women, you know? Um, And so like, I think that that is an important part that, that also colors this discussion as well. Well, I won't say a number, but I am five years older than Kamal. (laughs) So you can get out your calculator. You can figure that out. But um, I remember as a kid listening to his stand up records, I grew up with the electric company he was an, an indelible part of my life. Bill Cosby was someone who I was really, really young when the Cosby show was on. And then I've seen a lot of it in syndication and in streaming and all of that. The way that you look at this definitely ha- is impacted by when you attached to Bill Cosby, mm-hmm. right? If it were yep. was post-Cosby show, there's a whole conversation around like how controversial he was talking about pull up your pants and all of these different things and the pound cake speech and all of that. Um, that really gave you a different lens on Bill Cosby than if you, you know, were there for I Spy and saw him as a stand-up and then saw the show happen. So I think that's a really important part of it. Yeah. I think it's safe to say that even after this docuseries, at least for me, I still have complicated feelings Mm -hmm. about him. But I think that what is really great about the docuseries is that it it gauges with those things. And I think it's definitely worth checking out if you have any sort of interest in these conversations around who we believe and, and also who we idolize. So we want to know what you think about We Need to Talk About Cosby. You can find us at facebook.com slash PCHH and on Twitter at PCHH. And that brings us to the end of our show. It's been really great to talk with you all. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And we'll see you all tomorrow. I'm Guy Raz, and on NPR's How I Built This, how Telfar Clemens and Babak Radboy came together to build Telfar, a fashion brand that started in the clubs and side streets of New York and grew into a global phenomenon. Subscribe or listen now. Hey friends, Linda Holmes here. I'd love it if you subscribed to Pop Culture Happy Hour Plus. You'll get a sponsor-free listen and, this is key, you'll be supporting our show. Subscribe now at plus.npr.org slash happy hour.